night on first Tuesday. And she just bust out crying. She said, if you must know, you show me to make the best Christmas you've ever had because it's your last. Across Britain's health divide. The baby's coming. Okay. From the moment of birth, an unequal fight for survival. Good evening. In the poorer parts of Britain, people are much less healthy than those in the better off areas, and they die earlier. That was the central conclusion of the Black Report on Inequalities in Health, a 1980 official study with recommendations that the then new Conservative government refused to endorse. Eleven years later, what's changed? Well, statistics show that the health divide is as wide as ever. Just recently, Health Secretary William Waldegrave accepted a link between poverty and ill health, but, he said, the issues were too complex to tackle in the government's new discussion paper, The Health of the Nation. And the issues are complex, combining questions affected by public policy, like unemployment, and, on the other hand, matters of individual choice, like the decision to smoke. But the simple fact remains that in certain poorer areas, you're much more likely to get sick. Take South Teesside in the county of Cleveland, where First Tuesday found anything but a picture of health. David Carter was born eight months ago with spina bifida. Now, he's kept alive by a tube implanted in his head. <coughs> Mick Ellis is 48. In 1985, he was found to have lung cancer. Now, he survives on oxygen and drugs. They have one thing in common. They both live on the wrong side of Britain's health divide. Steel and chemicals dominate the south bank of the River Tees. For a hundred years, Middlesbrough has been a centre of heavy industry. Now, unemployment is high, and for many, the quality of life poor. The area has some of the worst health and highest death rates in Britain today. It's a stark example of the widening health divide between rich and poor. You went to work with a bad chest, you went to school with a, a bad chest was nothing, bad cough, it was just a, a common part of life, it was part of your life if you didn't have, there was something wrong with you if you didn't have a bad cough. You know, I've, I've never known any different. But you wouldn't find it on my records in the doctors that I'd been, been to doctors with a bad chest. That's probably why they never thought about looking for cancer in me. In poor areas, Death rates from some diseases are at least double those in more prosperous parts. The problems can begin at birth. Nationally, the risk of a poor family's baby dying in the first month of life is double that for the better off. 
At South Cleveland Hospital's special care baby unit, doctors are concerned about the number of mothers from poor areas giving birth to babies who are premature and underweight, conditions which can damage their long-term health. There are significant problems associated with low birth weight babies. Not only there is increased incidence of death, both before and after they are born, but among those who survive, a great proportion of them suffer from mental handicap, cerebral palsy, intellectual handicap, uh, several illnesses related to their premature uh, delivery. Doctors believe the stress of life in a poor area is an important factor in the causes of premature and low-weight births. There is no doubt that stress can cause early labour. There is no doubt that stress can upset how the body functions. There's no doubt that a body must be functioning well to nourish a baby. And I think it's through that, the level of nourishment and the level of the length of the pregnancy, the baby coming too soon, that stress presents us with the greatest problems. By stress, I really mean the unopposed or the impossible to escape from stress, not the stress where an executive or a prime minister is challenged all the time and can feel they're achieving things. I mean the stress of couples sitting in inadequate homes, in inadequate situations, with inadequate money, and this in itself has a bad effect on a pregnancy. In Grangetown, one of South Teesside's poorest areas, male unemployment is 33%, three times the national rate. Half of all households live on less than £100 a week. Across Britain, high unemployment has hit unskilled workers hardest, increasing the gap in wealth and health between rich and poor. People here die, on average, 10 years younger than those in the most prosperous places. It's just like a rubbish tip, Grangetown. So I think this is where everybody comes to bring the rubbish. When you are on the streets, the, the back alleys, you might as well call them rubbish tips. There's rubbish everywhere. Houses are boarded up everywhere and vandalised. I had to live with it, I had to learn to cope with the fact that I lived around here. And I had to just take whatever was coming to me because there's nothing I could do about it. Lynn Bell's first two children were both born yeah. premature. Now she's expecting her third. She fears it too will be born early. I've got Vicky, my daughter, she's 19 months. I've got Kimberly, she's three and a half years old. Um, well, there's me, I'm 24. My husband, Chris, he's 27. Just plain ordinary family. He's a motor mechanic. He works from half past eight till half past five on the night. He works six days a week. He works hard. We have to, we get by just on what he earns. You know, with the struggle, we get by. I mean, I'd be good to pay the rent to live in Grangetown, to be honest. But we just get by. I mean, we can't afford no big luxuries, nothing like that. Can't afford to go on holiday. Anything. Just live from day to day, really. I'm 36 weeks pregnant at the moment, which is up to now the longest I've ever carried a child for. So just keep my fingers crossed that I do carry the full, full time, rather than go through what I went through with Vicky the last time. I had Vicky early, four or five weeks early, and she was in special care unit for three weeks. And it was, it was terrible going to the hospital three times a day on the bus, just so I could feed her when she got bottle fed. At first I thought she was gonna die, just in case that she, she hadn't developed properly, with me having her early, in case there was something wrong with her that they wouldn't be able to detect until she was a lot older. I just looked at her, she was in the incubator and she had wires on her and, she just wasn't feeding herself. 
They had to put tubes down her mouth to feed her. Maybe she had time to give her a bottle. I was um, scared. I didn't want to go and see her. I was too upset to see her. I used to go down and look at her and come away because it used to upset me. I used to cry. I used to... No. Just keep crying, thinking that, praying, please, she has to be all right. Baby's bladder. He's getting something to drink. A routine ultrasound scan confirms that this mother's baby is healthy, but others are less fortunate. The birth of babies premature and underweight are not the only early problems doctors say are more common in poor areas. They also report a higher incidence of some physical abnormalities, birth defects, which can threaten children's survival. There may or may not be something you can do about that, and more and more fortunately, we're getting into the stage where we can find this problem early. There are more and more times when we can do something helpful about it, instead of just saying, I'm sorry, this one isn't really going to be all right. Um, there is no doubt that we have a higher instance of that. Carolyn and Richard Carter are unemployed. How are you? When Carolyn was pregnant last year, she was offered an amniocentesis test to see if the baby was healthy. Just five months. She decided against it for fear it could cause a miscarriage. Last Christmas, their son David was born. He had spina bifida. He'll need special medical care for the rest of his life. in March, Easter week. And it got all coiled up in his head. It's been shown fairly conclusively that spina bifida is much more common in areas of deprivation. So it's concentrated in urban areas where there may be poverty and deprivation. The reasons for that are not very clear and various suggestions have been made. Possibly one of the uh, most interesting suggestions is regarding diet and it's been shown that there may be a link between spina bifida and vitamin deficiency. And obviously, if you have a poor diet because you live in a poor area, then you may be susceptible to vitamin deficiencies, and this can predispose to spina bifida. Don't OK, David, shall we just roll you over, Pat? There we go. Uh, there we are. Where'd his dummy go? His dummy. Oh, yeah. I thought it was laid on it. OK. Right. And this, this is where the, the, the defect in the spine was, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, that's where the said deal was at the that's It's a congenital condition. Okay. I mean, the it's due to a problem with the spine uh, that doesn't uh, join together properly. And because of that, the nerves of the spine are exposed and the nerves then become damaged. No, we understand right. it as the spine was just split. Right. These nerves supply the, the legs, they also supply the bladder and the bowel. And so a child with spina bifida will have problems moving the legs, will often have paralysis of the legs, problems with the sensation in the legs. But you still have to make you just flop. There's usually hydrocephalus associated with spina bifida, and that's a condition of the brain whereby you get a blockage in the brain so that the fluid can't escape. And so you get a build-up of fluid inside the brain, and obviously that causes problems with pressure, and that needs to be treated with a, a drain, which is put into the skull. The Carters live on Middlesbrough's Thorntree estate. As in Grangetown, a third of all men available for work here are unemployed. In the past decade, 28,000 jobs have been lost at British Steel and ICI on Teesside. Richard lost his job at British Steel three years ago. He's tried to get other work, but has found it impossible. 
most of the time to get a job these days, it's actually a friend who'll put you in touch with somebody who's taken places on. The way jobs go in a British deal, and I tried to get in there where he used to work like years ago. And then a few weeks later, the contract had finished, so I couldn't get on. And then that was the end of that. So there's not a lot you can actually do around here to get jobs. I mean, everybody's closing down. You need all levels and all sorts of you're in ICI. And the South Bank Coke ovens, they're not taking anybody on anymore. They're laying men off. The Carters live on £65 a week in family allowance and social security payments. David's need for regular hospital treatment stretches the family's resources to the limit. He goes into hospital. When he's been in the hospital, he's been in the hospital for about, what, two months? And uh, each time he's in for over a week, and then you've got to have extra bus fares and extra food for Carol. And... Any child with a disability, there are a lot of financial implications. Um, in fairly simple terms, in looking after a child with a disability, you're, you're bound to have bigger bills for clothing, um, special diets, the fact that he may need to be in a pushchair for longer than normal, the fact that he needs to come up to hospital very frequently, so there'll be a lot of hospital fares to, uh, bus fares to, to pay, um, all that sort of thing mounts up. To get David to and from hospital, the Carters have so far relied on public transport. Now they've bought an old car for £50, which Richard plans to repair. Now that we've got the car, we'll be able to get about now once it's actually repaired and we'll be able to get out and about more with David Oman. I can't wait to get it done. I should get it finished. Won't take that much work, like. What are you going to do? Just mainly body work. Me brother will do the welding. And uh, they'll put seats in it and stuff like that. It gets depressing just mainly when he goes into hospital. When he's actually rushed in, like he was with uh, bronchitis. And you just don't know where you are. You don't know what to do. You don't know what's going to happen, like with like David. It's the best when you haven't got the money to actually run backwards and forwards to the hospital, and you run around like to family to try and find, well, money to get there, money for clothes, money for food. All diseases of childhood tend to be commoner in areas of deprivation. And there's, you could go through a whole list of diseases that, that are more common, for instance, respiratory disease. A wide range of other childhood illnesses are also more common. The admissions uh, to hospital here seem to be more frequent than in other places with all sorts of difficulties like diarrhea, uh, respiratory infections, uh, bronchiolitis. They're all more common in, in these sort of areas. In Grangetown, the local council plans to improve the area by providing better services and renovating houses. But Lynn Bell, expecting her third child, is determined to move. The family once had a better life elsewhere, but they couldn't keep up the mortgage and had to move to Grangetown. We got married and we seen a house. There was houses renting by, and we thought it was a good idea. It seemed cheap enough. In the end, we just couldn't afford to, to keep the house, so we had to give that up, and we went to the council, and they offered us this house, and we had to take it or go on the streets. This is what they offered us, and we had to take this. Otherwise, we'd have had nowhere. That's how we come to live here. The thought of moving in frightened me. I was scared. 
But it was a case of having to take it or go on the street, so we had to, I had to adjust to the idea of living here. We just still haven't adjusted. But it's a case of having to stay here. Um, no, fold, you fold them up with mummy. Take for our baby. Clever girl. I'm just sort of coming to, coming to terms with the mm -hmm. fact that there's going to be five of us in the family instead of four, feeding another baby, clothing another baby, another child. It's, it will be hard, but you have to get by, don't you? Good girl. Thank you. Really worried. With the two that I've got, I've never, never carried the full way. I've always gone maybe four or five weeks early, which is only about now for me, for, to have the baby. Never get you. I need a wash. <laughs> I need a wash. Even then, you'll be starving, yeah? I'm gonna make you cry. Adam Christopher Bell was born four weeks early. He weighed only five pounds, but was fit and well. But what are the prospects for Adam's generation as they grow up on the wrong side of Britain's health divide?
Six years ago, Mick Ellis was told he had lung cancer. Radiotherapy was successful, but his lungs remained permanently damaged. He had to give up his job at the steelworks. Like his father and most steel workers, he was a devoted clubman. It was life. It was the only place I went. And my father, my father, when he packed in, he'd done 23 years, he packed in till 11. I started off just on any committee, man. Went to sports, I ended up treasure. I do what I used to do. Well, basically, go for a couple of pints. Uh, small. Among men, death from lung cancer on South Teesside is 40% higher than the national average. Smoking is the main cause of chronic lung disease and lung cancer. <coughs> Research shows that people in inner Middlesbrough smoke more than the national average. <laughs> I can't do anything at all in the house. I can't, I can't change a light bulb. I, can't, I couldn't cook a meal at all. Or, uh, well, I can't even bath myself. I can't wash myself. What are the things that you miss most that you can't do now? Going to work. <laughs> One of the uh, things is going to work. Um, and just generally, well, being able to breathe normal, actually. I used to wake up during the night and hear her crying. I never asked him out. I got fed up with it. So one day I went down the club and filled myself full of Dutch courage. Really threw him back. The old bear come home and I said to her, hey, look, I'm sick of this. What's going on? I said, I'm sick of waking up during the night hearing you crying. I said, it's getting on my nerves. What's troubling you? What, what's on your nerves? Is it me? Is it me getting on top of you or something like that? And she just bust out crying. She said, if you must know, you told me to make the best Christmas you've ever had because it's, it's your last. Well, I got knew I was going to, like I said, I knew I was going to die. Yeah. I run upstairs and just laid on the bed, sobbed, sobbed me out and thought, God, why are High rates of smoking may also partly explain the higher incidence of other fatal diseases. In some poor areas, deaths from heart disease are four times the rate in wealthier places. Good morning. Right, how is your smoking going anyway? Well, I'm cutting them down. How many two? Circulatory disease associated with smoking can cut off the flow of blood to parts okay, of the body, causing gangrene. How many are you down to now, then? Oh, about eight. I cut them down a lot, but I, I started again. Is that for the Yeah, really. Sure. Yeah. OK, then. Let's have that out the way and you get back on there. OK? Yeah. Right then, come on, let's have a look. For James Nichols, circulatory disease has led to the amputation of one leg and now the possible loss of his other foot. You keep putting a bit of cream on it? Yeah, yeah every night. And then wash it up in the morning. 
He's had bronchitis since childhood. He also used to smoke 60 cigarettes a day. Sure, you want us to carry on? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. What about smoking cigarettes? Well, what about it? I guess that's still small. I'll be honest with you, uh, I look at it this way. It's, uh, I got cancer. People said, What are you doing this morning? What's the use of packing in? I've got it now, so and I've just carried on smoking ever since. It's not gonna. It wasn't gonna get me better, you know. You've already got it, so that's it. I never changed. I just carried on. But smoking alone cannot explain the high rates of lung disease in poor areas. In many districts of South Teesside, death rates are twice those in more affluent parts of Britain. 90% of the time that we, we spend dealing with patients here in the chest clinic and the chest ward is occupied by three disorders, uh, cancer of the lung, chronic bronchitis and emphysema and asthma. We know from uh, statistics that they tend to be commoner in industrialized areas. And we know from our own experience here that they're between one and a half and twice as common. Uh, some of them are actually even commoner than that, than the national averages. We're going down into the left lung. Why should it be commoner in these uh, districts? And if we take, for example, lung cancer and uh, chronic bronchitis and emphysema, most uh, chest specialists like myself would believe that the major risk factor for these disorders is cigarette smoking. We think that that probably explains some of it, but I don't think uh, on balance that it explains all. Okay, we've got into the trachea now. That makes them cough a little bit. Got some more anaesthetic into the trachea. I suspect that there is an environmental uh, effect. It may not be an environmental effect that's occurring now, uh, although that is one possibility, but we'd have to look at the effects of the environment over a period of 20 and 30, 40 years. These disorders are not disorders that develop overnight. Part of the explanation of the high levels of lung disease in poor areas may lie with the work people did and the air they breathed. Mick Ellis is a smoker. Hey, you just sit down. But for 15 years, he was also a steel worker. All right. Yeah, yeah. It's been accepted for many years that working in dusty or uh, environments where there's lots of fume it causes patients to have bronchitis. What's always been more difficult to establish is whether or not working in these environments gives rise okay. to airways obstruction or obstructive, chronic obstructive airways disease.
Now, there appears to be evidence emerging in some occupations. I mean, welders are a good example, where it's now established that uh, people who are exposed to very high levels of fume may well develop airways obstruction. Uh, and that is the case for those people who smoke as well as those who, who don't smoke. Um, my own feeling is that it probably was, it probably played a part, his work in the steel industry. But if you relate it to the other risk factors, it probably was not a, a major risk factor for him or a major effect, but it certainly, I'm sure, uh, played some part. Okay, when you're ready. Okay, fine. Well done. <laughs> It does. My nose tends to run. run. You know, mm. run like as if I've got a cold, like really. Well, this test's always been very difficult for you, hasn't it? In the uh, last six months to a year. <coughs> Let's get your breath back after that. If uh, you had been brought up in a district in which there were high levels of air pollution, as there almost certainly were in the central areas of Middlesbrough, particularly in the 40s and 50s, um, if you worked in uh, a dusty and fume-laden environment in the steelworks, and if you were also a smoker, then I don't think it's too hard to imagine that these uh, effects may multiply. And if that was the case, it may go uh, part of the way to explain why uh, some of the diseases that you've uh, been talking about are perhaps more commoner than you might be able to explain just on the basis of cigarette smoking alone. 20, 25 years. Is it? 25 yeah. years since you... Yeah. It's a long time. I can't get them this morning. Can you can't blame it this minute, can you? No. The levels of lung and other diseases on South Teesside are so high that they raise questions that go beyond established causes. No, I just shouted hello to her and I said I'll see you, see you when we get you downstairs, OK? OK. <laughs> Studies by Newcastle University show that the health of people here is much worse than people living only 25 miles away in Sunderland. Researchers suggest that one factor which should be examined further is that Teesside's main industries, unlike Sunderland's, entail air pollution in the vicinity of the plants. I think that clearly the, the fact that in both places, death rates are well above the national average. It's primarily due to the fact that we are talking about two populations that have experienced considerable economic hardship and economic insecurity over the years. These, these are areas that have been subject to continuous deprivation. At the same time, what we need to explain over and above that is why do why is being poor in Middlesbrough so much more damaging to health than being poor in Sunderland? There is a question in relation to chemical industry and steel because of the air pollution that is emitted from these plants, uh, which are, uh, in Teesside are uh, on an enormous scale, as to whether there is also a risk to the population living in the vicinity of these works. Now, these are questions that we can't answer at the moment, but they are questions that need to be examined much more closely. And we have, as a starting point, a particularly high level of mortality in Teesside that is unexplained in terms of the levels of poverty suffered by uh, um, the population living there. South Tees Health Authority found that the death rates from lung disease and lung cancer are significantly higher in some areas close to Teesside's industrial sites. No one knows why. Two pollutants which have been monitored, nitrogen dioxide and sulphur dioxide, are known respiratory irritants. 
but levels found have been well within legal limits and much reduced from levels 30 years ago. British Steel says research shows no link between respiratory illness and its dust emissions, which it says it's reducing. ICI says it has no data that indicates that its operations are causing ill health. It adds that it's doing all it can to identify the cause of poor health and is seeking ways to further reduce its emissions. In Grangetown, near the factories, 15 families are planning legal action against British Steel and ICI, alleging that their emissions have caused severe asthma among 26 children, claims which the companies deny. But even in other areas, further away from the factories, doctors report a high incidence of asthma, which can have genetic and other causes. Asthma is very common. We see a large number of children with asthma, and most of them seem to come from areas of deprivation. The reasons for that are unclear, and it may be problems uh, within the household. It may be problems uh, with pollution, for instance. Uh, it, it may be other problems. Uh, but certainly asthma is more common. No one knows the exact numbers affected, but many families, like the Robsons, have been prescribed nebulizers, machines which dispense drugs to help asthmatics breathe. Pat Robson, a non-smoker, has been crippled for five years by asthma. She's 42. Several times a year, she has to spend long periods in hospital receiving emergency treatment and physiotherapy. For women on South Teesside, the death rate from lung disease is even worse than for men, 60% above the national average. I couldn't believe what you go through. You feel as though you can't. Someone's got a big iron weight on your chest and you just can't get your breath. You think you're going to die every time you have one? That's what I feel now I have anywhere. I'll give your chest a little bit of a shake now. Yeah. You're going to do, carry on with your breathing exercises as you know them, and I'll give you a little bit of a shake and breathe right out. That's it. And again, just fill up there and right out. And again, and right out. <coughs> okay, have a good cough. <coughs> good cough. <coughs> Try and get it up. It's best for pot. Well done. Well done, that's fine. That's a good plug. Have you got plenty of tissues handy? Yeah, they're over there. They're over there. You feel as though something's coming up and just blocks you there. Just blocks you there as though you can't get any air out at all. Just can't seem to get your air out. Same as though, you know, like you're underwater and you're suffocating with the water. That's what it feels like. It feels so terrible. Pat's been known to the uh, chest clinic and the chest unit here for quite a long time. I think it's over 10 years. Um, she developed asthma, I think, in, uh, in her teens. Um, but it started to become troublesome, I think, when she got into her early 30s. She's also suffered, unfortunately, uh, very badly from a number of the side effects of the medications that she's required. Um, the steroid tablets that she's had to take have uh, made her gain a lot of weight and it's been very difficult in spite of attempts to diet uh, for her to lose this weight. And the second problem has been that uh, over a period of time um, she's developed uh, diabetes and the diabetes has been bad enough for her to need uh, insulin injections for its control. Two daughters have it, and all my grandsons have it. They all have nebulizers, the same as me. It's not in existence. It's not in existence like it used to be. That's why many a time when I think of the, the grandmans having an attack, you know, I think we, I hope they don't end up as bad as where I am. Because he's had a couple of bad attacks, I would say. 
Oh, he sits, sits on the bed many times and says, me, me, like you now, and I, <laughs> when he can't get his breath. And I say to him, I hope not. Don't do a lot, I can't get upstairs. Can't get upstairs. I've never been upstairs for about two or three years. I have my bedroom downstairs. I have everything in my bedroom that I need. into life out here. Definitely be there, I won't make it. I know that for certain. With old mum and dad dying so early, it's a thing you have to face. Research has established higher death rates in poor areas, not just on Teesside, but throughout Britain. The cost in lives is clear. A Cleveland County Council study reported the effects of the gulf between rich and poor in stark terms. In Cleveland alone, 820 extra deaths every year. Working class people, and particularly those from the poorer sections of the working class, suffer greater amounts of illness, uh, longer periods of illness, more severe illness, and die younger than those who live in more affluent uh, areas and in more affluent social classes. Death rates in the poorest areas are actually equivalent to the levels of mortality that the country as a whole was experiencing in the 1930s. Now, I think that putting it in that kind of historical context gives some measure of the severity of poor health in our poorest areas in Britain today. The kids have a free enough life. They do what they want, they go where they want. We take them for days out. They're all mixed sat in the car, they still do what they want to do. It must be more difficult for them because the, they haven't got the thing like he's never played football with them. He's never learned them how to ride bikes. Uh, we've got the young one in swimming lessons because Mick can't do it. So it might affect him like that, but they don't say anything. They never gripe about it. They never say, oh, you never do this, you never do that. They've just more or less accepted it. Mick will never... In fact, I don't think he'll be able to do what he's doing now in, say, two or three years' time. Because I think gradually his lungs will get worse and he'll just go down and down. All I want, I don't want to be a millionaire. I don't want loads of money. I just want to live somewhere nice, in a nice house, with the three children, my husband, and children to go to a nice school, just to be happy, one happy family. Money, money doesn't mean anything. As long as we're comfortable and happy and we're all together, that's important. We're determined to start afresh as we move from Grangetown forget everything that's happened around here and just to settle into our new home and just give the children everything we possibly can, the best of everything if we could. What life looks like on the wrong side of Britain's health divide. That's all from First Tuesday for this month. Until September, good night. <laughs>